Hey guys, it's Greg Jones for Engine Builder. Welcome to another episode of Intellectual Horsepower. Today, we are gonna dive into the details all surrounding camshafts and how camshafts work in engines. And to do that, I'm joined by some folks from the Edelbrock Group and Comp Cams. Today, we got Chris Potter. He's a valve train uh, engineering manager at Edelbrock Group, as well as Billy Godbold, who's the president of Godbold Engineering Solutions. Guys, welcome to the episode. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Absolutely. So I'm excited to talk about camshafts. I'm sure you guys both are. It's what you guys do for a living. And, uh, you know, this is a topic that, you know, it can be explained relatively simply um, or it can be explained pretty complex. Uh, and we're going to try to do a little bit of both and really dive into uh, the topic and, you know, give both folks who are been in the industry for a long time, professionals, as well as maybe some newbies and enthusiasts who want to know more about it, uh, some details that they can utilize. And with that, guys, I want to just dive into maybe some of the different types of camshafts that are out there and, and explain maybe what those different options are or what some of those more popular options are today. So I'll kick it over to you guys with just a little bit of explanation about, you know, what those different camshaft options are from, you know, flat tap it to a roller to solid to hydraulic. Uh, you know, let, let's start there. Sure. Well, you really just hit it on the head with those four different things <clears throat> at that point. You know, we've got solid and hydraulic lifters and we can actuate them or we can use them on either a, a flat tap it or a roller camshaft. You know, when we talk about, um, <clears throat> domestic uh, cam and block engines. You know, we've got direct acting as well and overhead cams and uh, slider followers and um, finger followers, et cetera, um, in those realms. But at the root of it, you know, most of us are gonna be talking about flat tap it, roller tap it, hydraulic or solid uh, lifters. Right, and Chris and I were talking about this before. You know, a lot of times you're going to make your decision based on the application, how it came. You know, if you had a Coyote that came with an overhead camshaft, you're not going to switch it over to a pushrod rocker system. Likewise, it'd be very expensive to take an LS that was done with a hydraulic roller and try to make that an overhead cam. Um, some of the stuff goes the same way. Like if you took a Y-block Ford that came from the factory with a solid lifter camshaft, flat solid lifter, retrofitting that to a hydraulic roller would cost a lot of money and really be a lot of custom parts that you wouldn't have a whole lot of confidence in. Um, yeah. Where we get confused with there being a lot of choices is like a small block Chevy, a small block Ford, a big block Chevy, a big block Ford, a lot of the Chrysler pieces, where you do have both options fairly easy. Um, and then you just split it up exactly like Chris said. First we go, do we want to have a flat follower riding on the camshaft or do we want to have a roller follower riding on the camshaft? A lot of time that's just going to be decision economics. You know, the roller, well more velocity but it's going to cost more then after you decide whether hey am i going to do a roller camshaft or a flat tap at camshaft you know then you have to decide do i want my adjustment to be manual where i go in there with the feeler gauge and feel in here and go okay now that's what the lash is or do i want a simpler system that's less um less maintenance and go with the hydraulic adjustment the hydraulic adjustment is really good today um they're nice pieces, but they have to be looked at every now and then. You know, um, Honda had in the 1990s in the Accord, that was a solid valve train that would go, you know, 50, 100,000 miles between adjustments. That's really hard to pull off. There's so much that can change with valve seat erosion, things like that. So do you want to be adjusting your valves? Um, the, the downside of hydraulic adjustment is with any aeration into the in the oil so you imagine these just like when you take open a coke bottle and you twist it you see the bubbles come up there's always micro bubbles inside the engine oil and this aeration in the oil it's always going to add some sponginess to any hydraulic adjustment system so that sponginess what you're gaining in convenience you're going to lose a little performance either at high engine speed or low engine speed because the system won't be as stiff with the hydraulic adjustment as it would be a mechanical. And that's why, you know, when you go look and you figure out what's going on, a lot of the guys who race 
in um, offshore power boats will have hydraulic adjustment. And nobody running NHRA Pro Stock or um, NASCAR has hydraulic adjustment. You go, well, why does the boat guy have a hydraulic cam and the Pro Stock guy have a solid? Well, all you need to do is adjust the valves one time with one of those marine exhausts in the back of one of these boats. And you'll figure out real quick yeah. that that's a royal pain. And is it really worth another 10 horsepower on something that makes a thousand horsepower to make, put in the high, the manual adjustment? Yeah. Sometimes the answer is yes. Oftentimes it's no. Yeah. Very good. All right. So uh, it sounds like the lifter selection as well as, you know, what that engine from the OE already has in it kind of more or less dictates the type of camshaft guys are going to be using. Um, However, when it does come to certain racing applications, you might have a couple of different options available to you. Uh, and Billy, you started to get into some of the reasons people might do one thing or the other, but you know, what, what's been popular today that, that you guys have been seeing? Um, you know, do people lean towards you know, one or two options over the, you know, another one or two? Yeah, I mean, mostly you're going to see people look at what works for their their system goals and that's what we'll probably say over over and over is you have to see your engine as a system mm -hmm. and a lot of times we'll recommend that people end with the camshaft not start with it you know when you're building an engine you think about okay well what engine am i going to build am i going to build a, a new godzilla am i going to build an ls am i going to build a new hemi you know what engine are you going to build so that's kind of your first question then as you get that question then you start to think about well, a big part of what an engine does is move air. So you'll choose your induction system, your cylinder head, your intake manifold, and then your exhaust system, your header, your collector, your exhaust. You'll make those decisions. And what the camshaft really is, is it's the conductor that makes all of these parts that you put together work well together. You know, the camshaft you know, we might say this camshaft makes 50 horsepower, you know, like we had this new LS, the new Hemi camshaft that, mm -hmm. you know, did a, a big article that made a 50 horsepower improvement. Well, the truth is the camshaft didn't make the 50 horsepower. The camshaft allowed that cylinder head and intake and exhaust system with that engine configuration to work so much better that the engine now made 50 horsepower. So, you know, that's the, the, the change that we're trying to preach is to go from looking at this as a parts to looking at it as a system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so guys, let, I guess let's dive deeper into that, you know, assuming that you have the, the type of cam selected that, that's gonna work with your, uh, your lifters and, and your other valve train, you know, what are those other elements of the camshaft that you know you got to go through and understand so that it does work you know as a system with, with the engine that you're trying to build well we look at <clears throat> going back to system we look at system stiffness a lot every camshaft that you've got is going to be a uh, variable duration camshaft mm. it's just typically we're moving in the wrong direction for what you want you know, typically we want smaller durations at low end to help build torque and larger durations at higher speeds um, to build power. Well, what we're looking at system stiffness is how much deflection we're actually inducing into the rocker arm, the spring, the load. The, the camshaft is telling the engine one thing and it's responding to another. So when we start trying to help iron out the specs, we have to look at that system stiffness to see what deflection we've got and then realize that that system stiffness is affecting valve events, not durations directly, but the valve events. Yeah. Yeah. A valve to a large degree is like an unruly teenager. You know, it's a 16 year old. You tell it to get off the couch and move and it sits there for a little while. And until you give enough external force to that teenager, you know, whether it's, I'm going to take your phone away, I'm taking your keys away. You know, you have to create this energy to overcome its natural resistance to movement. And that's the same thing, like when you talk about when you t want to open an intake valve, you know, because the system isn't infinitely rigid, 
it's going to sit there and deflect until enough load is applied that it actually moves. And that's one of the things that we try to explain to people that, you know, you can't show your engine, your spec card, you know, it doesn't know, it really doesn't see the cam that was ground. It sees what the valves move, how the valves move. And so we grind a camshaft, just like what Chris is talking about, realizing everything in the system to figure out how do we want this valve to move and realizing of course, that how it moves at low RPM is actually moving the wrong direction from how it moves. Cause it's going to take the seat timing. It's going to, squeeze it in and in and in and in as engine speeds increase based off that deflection when we really wish it would go out and out and out and out. So with system stiffness, what we're trying to do is keep it where that change is much smaller from low speed to high speed. Got it. Yeah. No, that definitely makes sense. And uh, seems like it would be more beneficial uh, for sure. We're preaching about that because as our customers and from general enthusiasts all the way up to racer can help understand that that helps us spec out something better for them in the goal you know from you, know, you call into the tech line and they start asking simple things you know cubic inches and expected rpm and then you get into well you know how much does the car weigh you know what kind of transmission you run and like some people why does this play into how my cam gets spec'd out why do you need to know that that's all mm -hmm. behind the engine but that all plays very critically into how we spec this thing. You know, what's it going to look like on shift recovery? You know, are you actually racing this all the time or do you want to drive around and have decent street manners, you know, and be able to, you know, do Saturday night cruises with the car. Um, in that same vein, as our customers understand system stiffness, we get to build better packages. We get to get closer to hitting the durations right every time and helping meet the customer's goals. That system stiff is going to be very different on um, even a stock LS engine versus what we're used to with massive dual springs and and even simple aluminum roller tip rockers on a small block Chevy style. Right. Because not only do you have the system stiffness, you have the system mass. So you've got the mass of the rock arm. You know, like people will go ahead and they'll look at this little beehive spring that's going 600 plus lift on an LS. And then they go, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and I'm going to spend some money on a really good race rocker system, maybe something from T&D or Jessel that's a, a great system in itself. And then they'll try to run the same spring. They don't understand it won't work anymore because you've just put a lot of mass into the system. Now, hmm. the rocker arm is probably a better rocker arm, but when you put that mass in the system, there's only one thing, you know, I used to design the camshafts, but not valve springs at comp. And one of my friends, he designed the camshaft and he used to tell me that I mean, valve spring. And he used to tell me that I only designed half the lift curve, that he designed one half and I designed the other half because up to peak velocity, the lifter is pushing the valve where it wants to go. And as soon as you cross peak velocity, you hand the baton over to the valve spring. And now the valve spring is having to control the system from that point. So a lot of the time, the first thing, the first questions we'll ask, when we're doing valve train design. You know, we ask all this about the engine configuration to try to figure out where's the engine going to, what's the cylinder head like, all of these things about the, the, the valve, the induction system. Then once we know about the engine, the induction system, the next question we're going to ask about is about the valve spring. You know, what room do you have? What valve mm -hmm. spring are you going to run? Because it is, you know, we talk about like the Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, the valve spring's trying to do everything backwards in the high heels that the camshaft's telling it. And right. then it's not just what the camshaft tells it, it's what gets through the system. So then we're going to ask things about, you know, what's the diameter of your push rod? What do you have a 7 16 You have a 3 8 You know, what, what, what's the mass and moment of inertia? When we ask about what rocker arm that you're running. What we're really thinking back in our head is, well, how much does it weigh? How stiff is it? And what rocker ratio is it? You know, so we're looking at stiffness, we're looking at mass, you know, in the mass we're looking at is the, the rotational mass, the moment of inertia of the rocker arm. So we're looking at what's the stiffness, what's the moment of inertia, and then we're going through the whole system and trying to figure out what can we tell this, the camshaft directly controls what the lifter does. How can we design a camshaft to move the lifter in such a way that through this system will move the valve in such a way 
that will not tick off this valve spring, that this valve spring can totally handle throughout the RPM and throughout the number of cycles that it wants. So it's a very methodical step that we go bam, bam, bam. And it looks like magic from the outside, but it's really not from the inside. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Billy, as you were just saying, you know, there's a number of different combinations that are at play here. And, and obviously guys have uh, a lot of different options based on their other selections within the valve train. Um, but maybe let's break it down, you know, on the street side versus, you know, a, a drag race type of application. Uh, you know, what are each of those guys looking for out of a camshaft so that it does work in harmony with with the valve events and, and you know, the valve spring is able to handle what the camshaft is telling it to do? Uh, you know, maybe let's start on the street side. Yeah, and I mean, the street side, a lot of times you're going to go in there and figure out, um, you know, a lot of times it's, you start out with, like, what are my goals? You know, what do I really want to do? Because the thing is, like, you know, a lot of people just open up a catalog, go to the, the camshaft on the bottom of the page, grab that camshaft, and then they're really disappointed, right? And you try to figure out, you know, sometimes the reason, like you talked about, the reason the salesman will talk so much about your system, about, about your, your vehicle, is that we're all a little bit ego-driven in um, performance, motorsports, and even the street side, and we're like, man, I want this thing to go 8,000 RPM. Okay, there's nothing about your engine or application that'll go 8,000 RPM. So, you know, well, you know, what do I really want to do? And then you get about five questions down with somebody and they say, well, you know, I need to go pick up my um, my daughter or my granddaughter at the car rider line every Thursday in this car and um, with the AC on, I don't need it to surge and I got to have the power brakes to work. <laughs> Okay, you know, that's just totally changed things because now yeah. our most important category is vacuum, not performance at 8,000. Because So we started out working on this 8,000 RPM application, and then we went, okay, it's not really 8,000, it's 7,000 or 7,200. And then we went, okay, it's not really 7,200 is where it's important. It's what's it doing at, at 1,100 RPM when it's idling. And then so, you know, will can the AC turn on in the car rider line and will the brakes work three times in a row? You know, when the person in front of me stops and stops and stops and I haven't, am I going to have to blop the throttle to try to get some, you know, intake vacuum while I'm waiting in line and freak all the moms out or <laughs> is this actually going to work? And so that's why there's so many questions that a, a good technician is going to ask you so much about your application because he's going to try to get those things. Once he has those things, then you go back to the whole deal, the, the whole Ginger Rogers, let's not tick her off, okay? What valve spring can we fit? Oh, I want to run this triple valve spring, you know, from this pro stock deal. And you go, okay, well, do you realize, we had this one thing like our friends do, y'all, you see these little boats that they race in Australia through these ditches and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, these things are crazy, you know, yeah. I don't know how fast they go, but it looks like 200 miles per hour <laughs> through a rice field ditch. Um, you know, you got the other guy sitting next to him going, Hey, this one, you know, you can imagine me, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. And he's going, oh, yeah, I got this. You know, um, well, those guys, what they do before they, before they race these, these boats, they'd stick them into this little pond to warm up the engine to get the engine up to temperature where well, they're running these triple valve springs for drag racing. And you don't understand like some of these triple valve springs for professional motorsports, a top fuel only goes a few hundred RPM per pass, a few hundred revolutions per pass. So some of these drag race springs, they can only cycle about 10 or 20,000 times before they break. And these guys weren't breaking valve springs on the race course. They were breaking them in the warm up pool. Some of the valve springs are so stressed out that you could just sit there. If you would probably, before you needed shoulder surgery, you could get on a Rimac and just go uh, 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 and break the valve spring. Cause it can only go a few hundred thousand times before it breaks, you know, or a few tens of thousands of times. So then you go, okay, so I don't want the bottom of the page, triple valve spring. I want this valve spring. And you go, okay, can you fit that valve spring? You go, well, I'd have to buy a new set of tie valves that cost $2,000. Maybe I don't want that 2020 installed spring. Maybe I want this one 850 installed spring. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you wind up going, okay, well, here's the valve spring. Well, what rocker arm are you going to run? And then they go, well, I want to run stock rocker arm. So you go, well, that spring has, too much load for the stock rocker arm. You probably, 
then you go back and find, okay, well, this is really the valve spring I want to run. Okay, this will work with my rocker arm that I want to run and everything like that. Then you go, okay, well, there's the rocker arm. There's the valve spring. You know, what push rod are you going to run? And you figure out, well, that'll fit my head. Okay, I got the push. Okay, which tap are you going to want to go through the solid tapping and go through all its adjustment? You want to go to the hydraulic because it's going to go into a boat or you really don't want to adjust valves or it's going to a customer that you don't want to adjust valves. And then you make that decision. Then after all that's figured out, then you can go in and figure out what where you want your four valve events. Where do you want to open the exhaust valve? How much overlap do you want in it for your vacuum? And where do you want to close the intake? And, you know, the most important was the intake valve closing. And that's sort of the simplest one because that really tunes in the RPM. But that's kind of your main, that's your main input for how the, where the, where it's going to make peak, peak torque and where it's going to make peak power. Mm -hmm. Exhaust open would change how it makes below that or how it makes above that, but from peak torque to peak power. And that's why people used to think like every 230 duration camshaft, 230 at 50 at intake duration camshaft made peak torque and peak power about the same place. It's because, well, everybody ran about the same lobe separation, about the same intake center lines. So they all had about the same intake valve closing. And that's where people kind of miss how sophisticated picking those points can be because it's so, so important to get your intake valve closing right for the RPM. Yeah, so Billy, you know, sticking with that street, you know, that street customer, um, you know, again, they got a lot of choices that they got to make to to make the combination and that system work properly as a whole. But, you know, what would be those two or three things that, you know, that they definitely need to know to make sure that they're selecting something that's going to work properly for what they want to do? You know, what, what's your best advice for those types of folks? I'd say, yeah, I, one, the best advice that I could think of is, yeah, don't go to the bottom of the page like Billy was talking about. Um, I think in most cases, in just about every case, I would rather size somebody a touch on the small side than too big when it comes to uh, durations um, because they aren't going to notice a lack of, Five horsepower. I want to get them all they can, but they aren't going to notice the lack of five up top. They will definitely notice that 20 or 30 foot pounds down mm -hmm. low in a street application. So smaller is always going to be a little bit better. Um, it'll be more enjoyable. I think you'll get more smiles on the face that way. Yeah, the, the you know, whether it's the street or the professional racing, you know, you know, we preach this all the time in the street, but I don't think people realize that even professional racing um more more world of outlaw sprint car races are one coming out of the corner than ever are going down the straight you know who can get that car out of the corner yeah. um this year watching nascar races i mean you wouldn't believe how often there'll be a wreck near the end of a race and whoever when that green flag drops for that last restart who can get off that who can accelerate faster will often win the race you know so and um you know nhra pro stock the more the harder you can get off the line the less gear you have to run in first gear and the better you're going to shift recovery coming to second so you know and people know like hey look you look at a car that's if it's if it's 400 faster in the first 60 foot it's probably eight hundredths to a tenth faster in the quarter mile and people don't think about that because you know, you're always looking at this big number on your dyno chart up here. But really, the lowest RPM, if you have somebody who can data log a, an application, whether it's professional race or it's on the street, the lowest RPM that you can reach full throttle, that RPM needs to be like circled in red, highlighted, put like 20 stars out next to it because that's the lowest RPM where you're ever asking the engine, hey, buddy, give me everything you've got. And where that number is, is going to matter so much. And that's why we ask a whole lot about gear ratio, about vehicle weight, gear ratios, torque converters, how many speeds are in your transmission. Because, you know, if you take a modern 8, 10-speed transmission, even some of the six ones, you can't get to wide open throttle below 3500 on those mm -hmm. you know now if somebody has a manual transmission and they get to wide open throttle at, at 2500 
really they're just not trying. You know, they would have been in a lower gear or feather in the clutch. Something, something's goofy there about just being a, a fairly poor driver or just playing around. You're just trying to detonate a rattle. But, um, you know, look really hard at that bottom. And I think that's what separates the great engine builders from the, the not so great ones. You know, anybody can make a big power number, but you look at the guys who sell a lot of engines in professional motorsports, you know, they almost don't care about giving you a dyno sheet. Just like take this out on the track and see what it does. You're going to love it. And it'll be exactly the same way on the street. You know, start looking, mm-hmm. focusing on what are you doing with the responsiveness of it, not what you're doing. You know, now sometimes you're going to have something that some guy, like he used to have this thing as big at drag at um, Bike Week in Daytona where everybody went to this chassis dyno and put their Harley on it and they tried to make the biggest number for, you know, bike week down there. Dude, if that's what you're after, that's great. And you're going to put a great big camshaft in it to do it. But don't be surprised that when you're putting around the beach, that yours is the absolute least fun bike to drive, but it made the best number on the dyno. You'd always want to bring two motorcycles down, one that you drove around and had fun with, and one that you put on the dyno. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not against people doing that. You know, if you want to go on the hub dynos or you want to take it out to the salt flats and run 200 miles per hour, hey, great. You know, we'll help you with that. That's a very different camshaft. You know, one of the things was funny, like when they came up with that that competition called Engine, the, um, what was it, Engine Masters that they called the Scott Parkhurst yeah. came up with the Hot Rod magazine, yeah. and they did this average from 3,500 to 6,500. And the idea was going to be that, you know, that this is going to teach everybody about what the best street cam is, right? But I guarantee you, you know, Kazi's won it like 11 times or something crazy, and and Bischoff's won it, you know, almost as many times, 10, 11 times. Ask either Tony or John if they'd ever sold a sold an engine for the street with the same camshaft that they ran for that competition. Yeah, and they tell you absolutely not. You know, this thing was this thing is a comp eliminator, and it does this, and it does this very very well. Did they learn some things about it? Yeah, but you'll never see them sell street cams with the 105, 104 load separations that they do on engine masters because they do that engine master build knowing that it's never going to see a transient throttle. I mean, you can't be on the street. And if you want to sit there and and press your, press the guy next to you, that's say you're doing a Lord forbid a roll race. Okay. You can't tell you guy, hold on one second. Give me five seconds before we go, before we leave. So I can get my engine to kind of clear its throat and be ready to respond. Yeah. But when you do an engine master, that's exactly what they do. They go in there and they pull it down to 3,500. They go to wide open throttle and they count to about five seconds before they hit the button and let it go. Well, they've let it stabilize. But in real racing, you know, I can't imagine they drop a green flag at World of Outlaws and they go, you know, hey, give me a second here. I've got to, you know, you know, okay, now let's go. No, you want something that feels like that the engine's almost, it almost can sense you starting to put load on that accelerator. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you want yeah. the the you know for a street car or most many types of racing, you want the the engine to be almost psychic. And the way you do that is by optimizing that overlap triangle with the exhaust opening intake closing to tune it in for the RPM exactly where you're going to make those transient where those transient changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so Billy you kind of you brought us to to that point in terms of really understanding what goes into, you know, figuring out the duration of a cam or the lobe separation and um, maybe ramp rates, you know, those types of things. So, you know, let, let, let's go there. You know, what kind of uh, dictates those types of numbers and those types of calculations, um, you know, more so on the racing side, obviously. Um, and, well, and, yeah, and, and it's the same whether it's, you know, a lot of the things we're doing on the street versus racing, it's, it's like, we don't, we never had two different teams at comp camps. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, well, these guys do your professional race stuff and these guys do your street mm-hmm. stuff. You know, we, we, it was kind of funny because the thumper, you know, we have that thumper sign behind us and that camshaft actually came out of something that we did for the 24 hour Lamont. You know, we were working with 
we were working with Yates Racing at the time, and they had the Panos, they had the engine in the Panos car. I don't know if anybody here remembers that car, but it looked like the Batmobile, except it was white. It was beautiful. And whenever it was cranked up, the whole paddock in France, like it was like the whole nation of France followed this car <laughs> everywhere it went. And it sounded just absolutely amazing. And what you have to understand is this was back when they weren't allowed to do all the pedal shifters and everything like that. This car actually had a, a real shifter in it. It may have been sequential, but it was, you know, you actually had to move something with your hand. And at two in the morning, going through the French countryside, you wouldn't really want to shift as much as, as you probably should. So they had one camshaft that they ran for the sprint races, the short, you know, 30 minute to two hour races. They had a different camshaft that they ran for the 24 hour races. And the 24 hour camshaft was what eventually became kind of the, the blueprint for the thumper cam. So what they needed is something that could come out of the corner when it needed to come out of the corner in second, it had to be able to come out of the corner, corner at third. So to do that, we really needed to make some power down low. So we kept shortening up the intake and moving it forward, keeping the same intake opening, but moving that intake closing earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier to get that intake closing where it needed to be to make cylinder pressure at low RPM. So that's where we started. And then we found out, hey, we've, we've done these specs and now the thing goes up to, goes up to 7,000, it falls off a cliff. Well, if you really look at it, if you start doing the simulations of engines, they should be almost as good a thousand RPM past peak power as they are a thousand RPM below peak power. Well, the reason this wasn't is because it was bound up with exhaust pressures. We made the cam smaller and smaller. We did what we normally do is we brought the exhaust down with the intake. So we got the smaller and smaller camshaft, but it wound up just all kinds of choked up because of a, a very, very late exhaust valve opening. So again, on the dyno at, at Yates, you know, we started, you know, moving that exhaust opening earlier and earlier and earlier. And we hurt that 3,500 RPM torque a little bit, but we really helped it carry out past 6,000. Well, it's funny, we did all this testing, probably went through about a dozen camshafts or more. And then right before they were going, you know, I remember Dennis Schoenfeld was running the dyno and he goes, okay, can y'all send me, um, I think, like send me seven camshafts. And I'm like going, okay, well, that didn't make sense. Why, why do you want seven camshafts? And he goes, well, I need one. I need, need one for the backup engines, the primary engines, the backup engines. Oh, and I'm building this old Ford pickup truck and I want one for my, my Ford pickup truck. And I'm like, Dennis, why do you want this camshaft for your pickup truck? He goes, dude, every time we crank this thing up on the dyno, it's the most wicked cool sounding camshaft we ever ha we've ever had. Yeah. And I didn't think about it, but what we had done was, is we tightened up the lobe, so it moved the intake earlier and earlier and moved this intake closing earlier and earlier. And then we'd gone back and kept the same overlap, but made this exhaust earlier. We had created something that, that opens when there's still more energy in that chamber. We made this really, really, but then we close the intake to make it where it's responsive down there, down at low RPM. And we accidentally made like the coolest sounding street camshaft ever. It's not the best camshaft anywhere. It's just not bad anywhere either. You know, it'll rev out because of the early, but it'll make this just like a sleepy driver at Le Mans, the thumper camshafts came out of this same deal. So I know this is like the longest, you know, chase the <laughs> rabbit around the tree 10 times story to tell you how you pick a camshaft. But really what we had done was we didn't think about lobe separations or durations at all. What we thought about is what do we want the engine to do? Then how do we build the valve events to do that? And then we come out with this thing. And you have to understand when, when I came to Scooter and told him I wanted something at 107 lobe separation with, you know, five degrees advance, he thought I was going to melt the exhaust off the cars. We had our first thumper camshafts actually went into one, uh, one of the engineers here was Corey Runia. It went into his, he had like a show car hot rod, you know, it was like a 67 um, Camaro. 
and yeah and he would he put we put the camshaft in it and we had to put egts all down the bottom of it to prove the scooter it wasn't going to melt his car down or or break anything because everybody was used to cams with a certain spec so if you stop thinking about duration and stop mm -hmm. thinking about load separation you know and start to go okay where do i want my four events and not even where do i want my four events at the tap it where do i want my four events at the valve so now we have to start thinking about is it a 1.8 rocker is a 1.5 rocker is a 2.0 rocker you know what's the rocker then we have to go okay well how stiff is it so back to that whole thing so you go through all of these things and and all of a sudden all the simple recipes that people say oh um, you know my favorite was people go go 120 lobe separate wide lobe separations they won't accelerate okay go to an nhra event watch the pro stock cars go down the line those things have like 120 121 lobe separations you know 119 to 122 somewhere in there for everybody in the field and that engine accelerates as fast as anything on earth it will go from you know it'll go from 5,000 rpm to uh, to the 11,000 to 10.5 and a little bit past the chip in well less than a second while pushing a 2,500 pound car you know like yeah. no a wide lobe separation will accelerate you know it's just what they were used to was a common setup what we're doing in pro stock what we're doing in professional racing is we're looking at each valve event independently we're looking at overlap based on how much room do we have piston to valve we realize if we take out too much you know if we put too big a pockets in there we destroy the combustion you know like on a street car if you put too much overlap in it you destroy the idle stability so you make it where the car is unruly below a certain rpm when you take it when you put too much overlap in a race application what you do is you carve up the piston top and when you carve up the piston top to get compression you have to put these pop-ups in it you have to do something weird in it to mess up the combustion chamber and then you have the combustion chamber so messed up that it won't do what it needs to do it won't burn quickly enough to extract that energy out of the fuel and like i said there's two things the engine does you know one thing is that it's an air pump and two it's a combustion device and so it extracts heat energy out of the potential energy of the fuel so that's where we get into what are we doing with overlap you know what are we doing combustion we're trying not to mess up the combustion efficiency of the engine yeah very good no I, Sorry about that. no, no I, I appreciate that um so billy and chris is it is it wrong to say like that people should not be so concerned with the duration numbers and those lobe separation numbers and and Billy, as you were saying, it's more about the valve events and getting that stuff right. Is, so is that is that kind of a common pitfall that you're seeing these days? Um, that people it's, are still kind of hung up on the that, numbers versus what's actually it happening? It is that way. People are, people are hung up on the numbers, um, and it's understandable why. You know, you give them duration in advance or in load separation, you know, I've got four numbers, and that allows me to pretty well describe and understand a camshaft. But truly, they're just byproducts of the valve events themselves and those valve events are what the engine is responding to. So I don't think we can ever fully get away from duration and lobe separation, but I do want people to understand that that's, you know, to get the, um, Oh, <clears throat> get the idea out of their head that those are what's affecting their motor and that this, this duration is what I need because this is what I'm doing. And it's, it's not the case. The duration isn't, it's where that intake, close is going to be where that EVO is going to be. Um, and the other two just, you know, help set in the overlap triangle. Um, yeah. Right. It, you can look and see, you know, we started, you know, if you go back to the old Sears and Roebuck three quarter race cam shafts, you know, of the 1940s, mm -hmm. right. You know, so we started describing cam shafts like, Oh, this is a half race cam and a three quarter race and a full race cam shaft. Well, over time, it went to start talking about durations, and that was more meaningful than three-quarter race. And then somehow we sort of took a turn in the woods and dumbed ourselves down again and started talking about stage cams. And this is a stage two, and this is stage 23.5, and this is the, you know, the screaming elephant camshaft. Oh, no, this is the squatting rhino cam. You got to have the squatting rhino cam. 
you know, so we had that little bitty turn. And then as everybody goes, well, okay, that, that's kind of dumb. Um, sales camp chest, kind of dumb. Customers don't like it. Let's go back to talking about duration of 50 and lift. You go, oh, this is a 600 lift camp. Oh, this is 625. This is 630. This one's 230. This one's 236. This one's 237 and a half. You know, so you get all of this stuff that was kind of about sales and trying to tell a little bit of information. But at the back of your mind, you got to go back here and go, okay, what's the engine really responding to? And really, you know, you go, as far as the valve events go, it's primary valve events, always going to be intake valve closing. You know, find that for a certain intake runner, a certain, a certain cubic inch, a certain RPM, it's always going to want this intake closing. And you'll never have to change that again for that, that engine speed unless you change the runner length of the runner cross section. Mm -hmm. And then you go back and go, okay, now we've got this one ironed out. Well, how much overlap do we really want in there? And you're either deciding your overlap based on your your low end vacuum, you know, or you're doing it based on space time continuum. You can't put a valve and a piston at the same spot at the same time. Bad idea. Yeah, bad idea. You can try to do it. It just doesn't go many cycles, you know. Um, you know, they 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 can snuggle up real tight, but they don't. You know, that hot exhaust valve does not like hitting the top of that piston. So you go through that, and then you go back. Okay, now my last tuning is usually the exhaust valve opening, and you try to move that exhaust valve opening. If you if you open it later, you're going to really help it down low because you get a longer power stroke, but you're going to choke it up high because of the thing. So what's happened is is that instead of talking about the primary the primary drivers of engine performance, which are each of those four valve events, we started talking about the secondary, which is the duration, like Chris said, the four points, intake duration, exhaust duration, you know, and then lobe separation in advance. And so if we'd really start thinking about what's driving performance, I think we can get better. And, and you'll see, you know, now when you start looking at things, you can start seeing that. So you look at you look at camshafts, the new camshafts you guys are doing for the LS cams mm -hmm. and the new cams you're doing for the Godzilla and even the new cams for the Hemi, you'll see different camshafts that have fairly similar operating ranges, but wildly different durations and lobe separations because they have the same intake valve closing, but they have different overlap based on the application. Yep. So if you were driven by durations, you wouldn't see that. But if you start looking at events, you can see why these two camshafts that look wildly different in duration and lobe separation are actually fairly close on intake valve closing and exhaust valve opening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, very good. Um, so while we're on the topic of just, you know, kind of some, uh, some different pitfalls that people might be experiencing or getting themselves caught up in, you know, based on things that might not matter, you know, what are some of those other types of pitfalls that you guys see, uh, you know, engine builders fall into and, and racers fall into uh, and, and what else should they actually be paying attention to? Now, I think uh, on the street side, one is the valve springs and not pairing valve springs well or not utilizing a valve spring to the full potential. You know, there's a lot of things that, you know, I've got 660 lift valve springs, but I'm still running, you know, a 560 lift camshaft on it. And yeah, like it'll run and it'll go down the street. But again, as a SIP system, you're not optimizing your components. You know, one, my seat load may, well, my seat load wouldn't change there, but my over the nose load um, either isn't matched to my lobe or I'm making that spring dance around way more than it needs to. You know, if I'm not tighter to coil clash, but it's just a misuse of components. Oh, I assume that this is going to be better because it's got more lift, but it doesn't do any good if you're not taking advantage of it. Yeah, there, there's you're doing no favors by picking an 800 lift spring and running at 600 lift. You know, they really need to be worked. We, we found, you know, we did some testing early on in the NASCAR side because sometimes we put more rocker on a on a system and all of a sudden it, it get better. You know, and you go like, hey, I went from 175 to 18. Now there's less valve bounce. And you're like, oh, well, hey, I'm running a little more load over the nose. That's what's doing it. So we'd actually take threaded ride and take a spring over and we'd press it down near coal bond. Don't try this at home. We're <laughs> professionals or dumb. Um, but we'd take this, this spring, put it threaded rod, compress it, stick it in the pizza oven at like 500 degrees, bake it for a few hours until it lost some load and then match the open load with the one eight. And we found out it wasn't anything to do with open load. 
it was about distance to coil bind. Mm -hmm. You know, we were running this other one closer to coil bind, and with a with a cylindrical spring, the really the only way you can take a cylindrical spring and stop it from from surging is to run the coils close to each other so that they dampen each other out. So when you have something that's set up to run 180, when you're set up to run 60 to 80 coil bind, and now all of a sudden you're 180 thousandths of coil bind, it never calms down over the nose. So it's so much better to figure out, okay, what am I really doing and build that system right? And I think that's where you see engine builders, you know, some engine builders do such a good job because they're not building a thousand different combinations. They're taking these these combinations and really building them spot on kind of over and over again. And then they have their development engines over the side where they're trying the crazy stuff. But until they get that development engine worked out, and we even talk about that with professional race race guys, you know, that, you know, when we're working with elite on a on pro stock motor together, you know, we'll have them. OK, this is your race package. Take this race package to every race. And we're going to go over here to this development package and we're going to work on it and rub on it until it's better than the race package and then rub on your package and then come back and make changes. Don't be just throwing things together because you can throw a lot of great things together just because this is a better rocker arm doesn't mean it's a better rocker arm in your package just because this is better valve spring. Every time a professional race team will come up and have a better valve spring option. We have to redevelop the valve, the low profile around that new valve spring. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That there's no that to do it right. You know, people always think that you know, oh man, doing a pro stock engine that goes eleven thousand RPM when it used to do that when it was fun. Um, you know, doing that so hard and then doing a a weed eater or a ship motor cam's got to be so easy. And really, it's not that whether you're at the very high end, whether you're designing Formula One at near 20,000 RPM before they rev limited, or you're designing something for a ship motor or over the road diesel, you're <clears> still <throat> trying to, to optimize the package to the absolute best it can do. So there's no there's no shortcuts for this. You've got to optimize around the package. All right. Well, with that, we're going to wrap up today's episode on camshafts. Again, want to thank Billy and Chris and everyone there at Edelbrock Group and Comp Cams. Uh, really appreciate the time. If you guys at home have questions, make sure you guys are leaving that stuff down there in the comments, and we'll pass that along to those guys to get some answers. And uh, we appreciate you watching this episode of Intellectual Horsepower. Make sure you're checking out EngineBuilderMag.com for more great uh, engine content, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks.